our series on as it is in heaven, and we're still talking about prayer, which is probably the most least thing the church does as corporately. When is the last time you've gotten together with believers and prayed? If you understand something, and I shared it, I think, Thursday night, was something I heard someone say. It's really simple and yet profound is that the church is the only people that know what's going on in heaven. That's it. The government doesn't know. Lost people don't know. Um, the devil doesn't even know what's, what's going on in heaven. But the church does. So that means that we have access to what God is doing, not just to keep to ourselves, but to see it, believe it, pray it, in order to manifest it on earth. Because we are the only ones God has called to, to change the lives of people through the message of Jesus Christ, um, which is sharing the kingdom, advancing the kingdom of God. And so prayer is something that needs to be talked about, more taught about, more encouraged more than what it has been. And yet it's the most misunderstood. When's the, when's the last time you desired to pray? It may be simply because we have never been taught how to pray. And I believe that the messages that the church has been hearing for a couple decades now have you at the center of the prayer. And therefore, you're going to God with what you want. And you're not getting your prayers answered because God's not about what you want. You need to be about what He wants. And so because we're not getting our prayers answered because we're coming to God already on a false premise through the teachings that have been taught for for years now. And it's, it's, a, it's frustrating because you're going to God. Think about how most people pray. You're going to God with what you think he ought to do and how he ought to do it. And all you're doing is telling God what's going on on earth. When Jesus had us pray, we need to be praying what's going on in heaven. So we're going to take this another another week on prayer. And the reason, because I, the only way I can describe this, I was trying to figure out a way that you could understand where I'm coming from, what I'm sensing in the body of Christ. And that is, there is a, um, I was telling Stevie this, and how I'm going to be able to bring this together. Um, there is a message that the church is hearing, and there's different fragments of it, that, that makes everything about us as individuals. And there's no cross to it. There's no death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and outpouring. The message you're hearing, and I did something on the radio about the New Age and how the church has been so influenced by New Age and that you've got even Christians today that will listen to people that teach Buddhism, that teach Confucius, and all these different things. And it's like, well, that's a good teaching, I'll grab that. That's a good teaching, I'll grab that. And Christians are, well, that makes sense because it relates to God. It makes me a God. It does this, it does that. And there's no cross in it because there's no death in it. So, well, okay, so there's no cross. They don't believe in Jesus. But, but the, the teachings make me feel good. The teachings give me hope. The teachings encourage me. But there's no Jesus in it because for Jesus to be in those messages... There has to be death involved in that. And the best way that I could explain that, now check this out, the best way that I, I came up with this, I mean the Lord gave it to me to help me understand it, is that everybody has ate someone else's food that they cooked. How many have ate somebody's food or your own and it was bland? It's just no flavor to it all. So you've got salt you can add to it. You've got pepper you can add to it. And how many have tasted something and you could taste the salt? You could taste the paprika, or you could taste the whatever, oregano. You can taste the different seasonings when you're eating it, right? Well, that's how Christianity is preached. Because I may not preach on the cross, 
But you can hear it come through the messages. Yes. You can you can hear death come through the messages. I know I won't have to say anything about the death because I've died, and that death has happened to me, and I've experienced that death, and now all my messages are influenced by that death. Same thing with resurrection. I don't have to preach on resurrection. You'll hear it. You'll taste it. You'll sense it in the message that, I, that I'm bringing forth. Um, ascension. You'll, you'll get that. from. So I, don't, I can teach on all those things, but all those things are the ingredients that make up what we call the cross. The cross is just not the death. If you say the cross and you're just talking about death, you, you, my God, what else do you think he did? He rose again. But he's also buried. You've got to talk about that. And then he ascended. That's part of the cross. And then the Holy Spirit was poured out. That's the last thing he did. So when you talk about the cross... You may want to write this down because I wouldn't even plan on saying this. When you're talking about the cross, it has to involve death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because what good is it that he ascended? Okay, he was resurrected. That's great. And then he ascended. But now we're stuck down here. What changed? He sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we too now are identified and experienced death, burial, resurrection, ascension through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then when I preach a message, all that comes through, whether I say it or not. You sense death in the message. You sense resurrection in a message. Because if you don't sense that, then I'm not teaching Jesus. Because isn't that what he did? And what am I doing talking about anything other than what he did? And that's what's happening in the church today. They're talking about everything else but the cross. And it comes through. And so death is the big one. I still have to say death is the big one. When you go to the throne and you pray, you pray out of death, meaning not my will, but your will. You pray out of death. Now I'm dead. I'm alive in you. And I can only be about you and what you're doing. I can't be about anything else. I died. I can't come to you in of myself. That man dead. That man died a long time ago. I rose again in newness of life. I come to you in you, through you, for you. So if you got your outline, let's look at the introduction. Prayer is the only medium that we have to commune with God. We have access to heaven. We become privy to all that God is doing through prayer and, and what he's doing. If he's doing it, then I'm doing it. If he's not doing it, I have no business stepping out in it. See, here's where we're coming to God, what we want, that he's not doing, and then we jump out there and try to make something happen, praying that God will get on it, you know, and these guys like, I, I, you never saw that in heaven. I don't know what you're doing, but you did not, see, what you're doing, you did not see in heaven, because I'm not doing that. You came up with that through the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You let the enemy put that in there. You looked at what somebody else said and said, I want that, and you came to me for it, and I you didn't even see, you didn't access heaven to see what I was doing. So if he's not doing it, then I'm not. Why? Because we're co-laborers. We're participants in God's plan, not ours. Yet so many in the body of Christ have gone rogue, especially pastors, ministers. They're, 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 the, they're the worst at it. Why? They're building a kingdom. They need money, so they come to you all the time talking about money. They need workers, and they're always telling you how to volunteer. Hmm? I guarantee you, you've never heard many messages up from here from on money. You know you have. No, we haven't. And you never heard me talk about how we need help. Help us, help us. We need somebody to do this. We need somebody to do that. Never heard that either. In fact, you've heard more on money, which you really haven't, than me trying to get volunteers. Why? Because I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit tells you everything you need to do. I am not your Holy Spirit. And if God's not doing it here, that means he's not doing it there. Hmm? That's, I, I, can't, I can't manipulate, I won't intimidate, and I'm definitely not into domination of the saints. I don't lord it over God's heritage. He's Lord, not me. So, But you got ministers today that's all about what they want. And they're looking how to better their building, how to better their property, how to get bigger, and how to get better. And they're not getting anything out of heaven because it's all about them. They think what they're doing is good. Well, why wouldn't God want me to have a bigger building? Why wouldn't God want me to have this? Why wouldn't God want... 
Well, it's not about what, what you think he wants you to have. It's about what did you see when you prayed? When's the last time you saw something and heard something when you prayed? Or did you just go there and do all the talking? God knows I, I meet with people periodically and they love to do all the talking. And the minute you can get a word in edgewise, they're not listening. They're only thinking about what they can say next. Is that how we are with God? Or do we go there and listen more than we talk? And then what we see, we know what he's doing, and then we participated in it. And I've got no business of praying, praying about anything unless I've seen it or that I've heard it. So, and then Christians are, they, they basically take their cues from what they see their pastors and leaders doing. So now they're out there doing the same thing in their own personal lives that the pastor's trying to do in his kingdom he's trying to build for himself. And Satan is an angel of light, will help you along the way, lead you astray, deceive you. You're still saved, still go to church, but you're living life on your terms, not God's. You're driven by your drive desires, not from what you hear in heaven, so that you can manifest on earth. So in Matthew 6, 9, we're going to look at this again. Matthew 6, 9, Jesus gives us um, the way to pray. Now let me just say something here. I've heard people use this. When Jesus said, Our Father who, are, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. They said, Quit calling that the Lord's Prayer. How many have heard that? Why? Because God never, you never heard Jesus pray that. So that's our prayer, not the Lord's Prayer. But I, you know, and I've always heard that, and I thought, okay. However, nobody ever heard Jesus pray. Because <coughs> he would go up to the mountain and pray. They don't know whether he prayed that or not. So he's not going to sit there and, you know, pray in front of a bunch of people because that's the very thing he said not to do. Don't play, pray in public so that you can be seen by people. So he go off to private to pray. So they have no clue whether he prayed that or not. But there's aspects of that that he did pray, like the garden. Not my will, but your will be done. So don't let anybody say, that's not the Lord's Prayer. He never prayed that. You don't have a clue what he prayed. So just, you know, everybody thinks they know stuff and they really don't know anything. This is a prayer he prayed, obviously, and he gave it to us to pray. And here it is. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, prayer, this is the manner in which to pray. And prayer is not this. You go to God telling him what you want and then wait to see what he wants you to do. Like it's a two-way connection thing. It's one connection. It's one way. You're there to hear what he's doing. And then you come back and you do it. Now, you if anybody was in the military, and I know I keep using Robert because he's the only one I know that was in the military. But I guarantee you when he went to the sergeant, the sergeant didn't, didn't say, what do you want? All right, I'll do that. But if you do this, like they bartered with each other. That sergeant could care less what he wanted. It's what the sergeant wants them privates to do. And it goes, and the chain goes up, right? The, the general doesn't care what the sergeant wants. The orders come down from top to bottom, never from bottom to top. And if you're, if you're a boss of a business, the last thing you want is your employees to tell you how to run that business. You would not let anybody work for you if all they did was go rogue on you and doing it their way, regardless of what you wanted. And they're always telling you what to do, never hearing what you want them to do. Who would hire someone like that? You could never get what you want to accomplish in your business done. And yet we treat God the very way we would want to be treated. I don't like people telling me what to do. How many would love kids telling your parents what to do. They'll, 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 they'll try that. Kids will always try to tell parents what to do. And how would life be if parents always did what the kids wanted them to do? What, what kind of family would that look like? And what kind of family would God's family look like if all he did was do what we wanted him to do? Because that's how we pray. We know exactly what we want, and we know exactly how he should do it. And then when it doesn't happen, we're like those little kids who didn't get the way. And now we're mad. We, we get offended at God. Jesus shows us here in this verse that 
we participate in what we see God doing in heaven so we can manifest on earth. So we have one understanding in prayer. The kingdom of God being established in earth. That's what prayer is about. Prayer is about the kingdom of God being established on earth, the will of God as it is in heaven on earth. This is our only connection and communion we have with heaven, prayer. Our human life, our life is not human. Once you're saved, it's fathered by God. So no longer you're driven by humanity, you're driven by the spiritual realm. You're driven by what God is saying and doing. And your origin of prayer, our origin of prayer takes us from all human relationship to a resurrection origin. Prayer is not the most effective act of, prayer is the most effective act of faith when it originates from heaven. Because now you're praying the prayer of faith. When you're praying what you want, you're praying the prayer, praying from the realm of, well, I wonder, I hope so. There's no faith in that. But if prayer is a constant rhetoric of earth's constant conflicts, and that's what most Christians pray, what's happening around them. Watch this. If prayer is a constant rhetoric of earth's constant conflicts, human frustration and fears or worries that are being rehearsed before God, we don't know how to pray. And that's what most people do. We're taught to do that. We, t we're, we are taught, I don't know where it came from, I guess it's just a knee-jerk reaction of humanity to think that we're going to go to God and tell him everything that's going on down here. Rather than going to God, find out what he's doing in heaven, and then telling earth what's going on in heaven. Not going to heaven, telling God what's going on on earth. And I said, Greg, I've heard you say this a million times. I'm telling you, you, don't, uh, you may say, I know this, but it's just like, if, just like a, you, 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 let's say you digested something. It just doesn't go in one part of your body. It spreads out like gangrene. You think gangrene just goes to one? It starts what? Spreading. When you grab the kind of theology that's being preached for the last decade or two decades or forever, for that matter, because this, this stuff's been going on as far as I've been in the church, this kind of praying, it, it goes through every area of your life. So you say, well, I know this, but you don't pray it right. You still go with a knee-jerk reaction, and in your conversations with other people, and in how you look at life, you still go, what? There's no what anymore once you see that. Once you see heaven, this does not move you anymore. That's why the Apostle Paul says, none of these things move me, because these things get moved by heaven. So they can't move me. I've already been moved by heaven. So I'm, I know you've, you, we've said this, but God's like, he won't let me stop getting this, because we've got to get this revelation, or our prayers are just going to be the same old, same old. And if the praying is wrong, heaven can't come on earth, because... Again, he's not going to use lost people, and he's not going to use the governments, thank God. He says, there's only one group of people that I'm going to use to bring heaven on earth, and the way they know what to do on earth is through prayer. And if the praying is wrong, then the expression down here is going to be wrong as well. So we're not going to go to God with this constant rhetoric of, look what's going on, what's going on here. And then in Matthew 6, 7, 8, he talks about that. Watch this. But when we pray, use not vain repetitions, which is that ongoing Lord. What's, how many times have you told God how bad your life is? How many times have you complained about God about this, that, or the other? That's vain repetition. He says the heathens do that, for they think that they will be heard by their many words, for their many speaking. He says, is not, he said, be ye not therefore like unto them. For your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask Him. So what's He saying there? He's like, look, I already know all your needs before you even ask. So let's not make the need your orientation when you go to pray. I already know what you need. So you're going to sit there and repeat and repeat and repeat. How many times have you talked to God about your finances? How many times you talk to God about this, that, or the other, right? So he's saying, don't do all this vain repetition. That's what the heathens do. They think by their much speaking and praying and constantly going to God, you'll hear them then move on their behalf. But the verse prior to that, the verses prior to that, or after that, he says, this is the manner in which you pray. You go to heaven to hear what God's doing, and then you know what to pray and agree with and do down here on earth. 
So what did Jesus say about need? Your father knows what you have need of. Did he say not to ask? No, he said, now watch, this gets tricky, so listen carefully. He said, before you ask, he already knows what you have need of. So do I not go to the father with my needs? Look at Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So what you're doing is you're seeking, kingdom, you're seeking the kingdom first. That's why you're praying. Praying puts you in the mode of seeking first the kingdom. So when you go to God with needs, you, you're, seeking the, you're, you're seeking for the need before God. You're taking the need to God. That's not seeking the kingdom. That's you seeking for him to do something for you on earth. So that's why he said, I already know what you have need of. And then he says, I have provided all your needs. When you understand needs and that they've already been provided for, he knows the end from the beginning. What you're going through does not take him by surprise. He's already made provision for the need that you have today before the foundation of the world. In Christ, he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Therefore, he knows all your needs. They were met in Jesus before he even came here. We are so stuck and untaught by needs that we are, we are strictly need-oriented with God. Can you imagine what your prayer would look like if you didn't go to him with need, knowing that your need was already taken care of? Watch how this works out. So we go to the kingdom, and we seek it first, and he says, I'll add all these things unto you. And prior to that, he says, take no thought for your life. Meaning, take no thought for your needs. Because that's the context. I, he says, I feed the birds. I clothe the lilies of the field. I do all that. So why are you worrying and fretting over needs when I'm already your provider? Jehovah Jireh, I called myself your provider. So why the need thing is irrelevant anymore. So if you're in need, you go to the Father and say, Lord, you're seeking the kingdom. What's going on? What are you doing? Then whatever you hear him doing, then you come down here in spite of the need. You speak what you hear. You act on what you see. And those needs will always get provided for because... Watch, we're, I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me, let me back up here. So, no, so need is not the major focus of our relationship with God. I'm going to have to really stick to my notes today, so because I'm going to be all over the place if I don't. Need is a supportive function. So the relationship of, of, of need is found in Matthew 6.33, so need is not the major focus of our relationship with God. Need is a supportive function. Now watch, look at electricity as an example. Electricity to your house. You have all the appliances, you have all the equipment, and there is a supply of electricity for those things to run. God will supply your needs according to what? His riches and glory. So you don't have to pray for electricity. It's already been provided for everything in your home or everything you're doing in life. Okay? You don't call the... The, the, the mon power up every morning. You guys going to give me electricity? You, you, you're not going to cut it off, are you? Oh, how I need electricity. God, give me electricity. No one. See, because you already have it. So why are we praying for things he says, I've already got you covered? And you know what you'll say back to me? Well, because I have need. Now watch. He says he supplies needs according to his riches and glory. If your needs are not being met, if they're not being supplied and you're in a deficit when it comes to need, then it is not in accordance with his riches and glory. Let that sink in. So if I've got a need and he's not providing it, which makes me have to go to him, then I'm in the deficit on according. So what does it mean according to his riches and glory? You spend money according to what? Huh? What's in your bank? Please tell me you don't spend according to what's not in your bank, because then you're writing bad checks. You spend according to what's in the bank. He provides according to what he's already purposed in his glory, according to all his riches. And what's the Bible say? He's our father, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's not broke. Well, I am. I've got need. Well, then you're in a deficit. And his, so therefore, if you're in a deficit, he's not providing according to his riches and glory. So what gives? What gives if he's not providing? 
If your needs are not being supplied in, limi in, in limitation, then it is not being supplied according to his riches and glory. So there's a big difference here. What's the, what's the difference? You are doing things with money you never heard in heaven. And that creates the deficit. The deficit is not because he's not providing. It's because what he's providing, you're spending it on things you don't need or should have. Because we do not see ourselves as stewards. You know what we'll do? We'll go to God for healing. We'll go to God for deliverance. We'll go to for God for a house, for a car, all this. But we don't go to God how to spend money. We don't have, do you realize that only 20% of the church even gives? From, from, from what the, stat, for the stats say? So we're not even big stewards. We want God on every area of our life. But when it comes to money, or there's, I'm going to tell you, that's why the need is there. Because we're not going to heaven to find out how to spend, what to spend, and when to spend it. We're not stewards. And the whole, of the whole gospel parables are about stewardship. He gave one one talent, gave two, gave five, and they came back. One didn't do anything with it. You know, or how about the prodigal son who took it all and went and spent it all, and look where he ended up. In need. Out of those two sons, who was in need? The one that stayed home and was faithful with his, to his dad, or the one who went out there and blew through his inheritance? The so it was not, you know. So don't blame God. See, you're always going to God, and it's for your own, because you're behind the eight ball. You're not going to God about how to spend, and therefore that creates the need. Now, that's, that's simplistic. It's a general, generalism, but at the same time, you'll get out of need when you start hearing God more and seeing what he's doing and de determine not to spend anything unless you know that's what he's doing. Now, I'm not talking about necessities. Those are given. Okay? Don't, don't say, I'm, I'm not going to pay my light bill today. I didn't hear him tell me to pay my light bill. All right, well, then go be in the dark. You always got people that have to take things to the extreme. Okay? So, Romans 12, 1. Now, we're going somewhere with this because de de our death has to be portrayed in our praying. As I said earlier, when I talked about death, burial, resurrection, all that seeps through the way we pray. And it will help us. We understand Jesus and what he did. It will help us pray more efficient prayers. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to do what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Just stop right there. This is, this is the mandate of God. This is what he wants as saints, to present our bodies as living what? Now, I'm going to tell you something. Ain't a whole lot of sacrificing going on among God's people today. You know why? Because it's not going on in the world, and it's not being even taught. Sacrifice. I had a conversation with someone, and I said, you know, they're asking me about, I was saying, you want me to be honest? Yeah, no, really. You want me to be honest? I said, you, you, this is somebody in the family, so I know them. I said, you do not sacrifice for nobody, nothing. Everything is about you. It's not about anybody else. Well, I do, no. You do that because you're going to get a return. I'm not talking about things you do because you're going to get a return back. A sacrifice is this. I'm going to do something, and I'm, and I'm not going to get a return on it. No one's going to thank me for it, and I'll probably be persecuted by it. But I know that's what God wanted me to do. And there's no payoff. That's a sacrifice. You just you do it, and there's no one knows you did it, so you get, can't get no applause. Half of the stuff we do we call sacrifice is, oh, convenient to do. There's some type of a payoff back. He says, we're just living sacrifices. That's all. He says, I want you to present your, now, if I was on the chalkboard, underlined bodies, underlined sacrifice. Why? Because this is holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's unreasonable today in the church because no one wants to sacrifice anything because it's not, it, it, it's, it's, they don't get anything out of it. We created a bunch of narcissists. The kind of preaching and teaching, new age stuff that's crept into the church creates nothing but me, 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 me. And if I do anything for others, it's still about me. Because you know why? We never heard him say anything. Because what he'll tell you to do 
is put your body out there as a living sacrifice, and that ain't easy, and it doesn't pay off. Now watch, living sacrifice, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. We'll get back to Romans here in a minute. But he that is joined unto the Lord is what? Now you can't break away from that. I'll tell you who has the most problems in marriage. The first five years say they're the hardest in marriage. It's the guy who doesn't know that. Because he's still acting like he's single. Now he's married. Now, you can't blame him to some degree. Probably never been taught. This is the first five years. They're, they're the hardest. But when you got a guy who thinks he's still got his own bank account, he's still got his own car, no one's going to spend his money, drive his car, or tell him what to do on a Saturday morning, or keep him from doing this, that, or the other, all the stuff he was that's single. That man doesn't know that, and he's going to have a problem, right or wrong. Huh? Right, right. So are you going to have a problem, because you're married to the Lord, and you're bought. Go next. Go to the next one. Watch this. Two verses down. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You've been joined to the Lord as one spirit. You're no longer solo. Everything you do now has to be in mind of Him. Just like the husband. Everything he does, he, he has to keep in mind wife and family. He can't just go do what he wants to do, spend money how he wants to spend money. He has somebody else he's one with that he's accountable to. I wish that would be in the marriage. That you, you know, accountability. When you, when you get married, see, a lot of guys don't want to get married. They want to stay single because they don't want to be accountable. And that's okay. That's your choice. But it doesn't happen in the kingdom. You're, when you got saved, you became one with him, and you are not free to do whatever you want. You have to be accountable to God because you're not your own. You're one with him. Your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you live a life of sacrifice, which is pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Next. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God how? In your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body is God's, not yours. You're not free to go do whatever you want, when you want, and how you want. You're not even to pray how you want. Throw prayer there now. When you go to God as a sacrifice, and prayer is a sacrifice. You know why people don't want to speak in tongues? Coming down here today, we just did a thing, and I'm going to, so I want to throw this in here because it was a thought that came to me driving down here that I thought, oh man, I wish I would have said that Thursday. Do you know why people don't like speaking in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit? It just hit because it's unfruitful to the mind. And if it does, if it's unfruitful to the mind, why do I need to do it? Why? It doesn't, it's not a payoff for you. It's not a payoff to you because you don't know what in the world you just said for that 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes or so. So why? It's unfruitful to you, so why do it? Because you're only going to want to do that which is fruitful for you. And I'm like, oh my God, that makes... That's why you never, Paul, that's why he was trying to get them, hey, come on. My desire is that you all do it, and I do it more than you all. But the problem is it's unfruitful to your mind, therefore you don't think there's a profit in it. Because you don't live your life as a sacrifice. Everything has to be a profit. There's always going to be fruit involved, but not the way God's telling us here. This is death. This is the way of the cross. Can you understand what I'm saying now? All of this uncross messages come to us, and then we go to God praying, influenced by all this bad theology. Not coming to Him through death, burial, and resurrection. Now, um, 12.2. Romans 12.2. Now He says that, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and what? Perfect will of God. That's what we're all about. The perfect will of God. So you have to now see that, and let me stick to my notes here. I'm going to be a renewed mind does not make a better me. Let that sink in. A renewed mind produces the proof 
of the good, acceptable, perfect will of God that establishes heaven on earth. A renewed mind brings about evidence and demonstration. A renewed mind does not give me a better thinking process. Because it's not about God making you a good thinker. Okay? That's, that's you making yourself better. A renewed mind does not give me a better thinking process. A renewed mind produces the evidence of what the will of God is in heaven. My mind cannot be renewed for anything other than what God is doing in heaven. That's what the renewal of the mind is for. So you know what's going on up there. And not only that, but that you know what he did on the cross. In his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and outflow of the Holy Spirit. Those are all things we renew our mind on. Things that have to do with Jesus is what we renew our mind on. And then when we go to heaven, God, the Holy Spirit, opens those things up to us, renews our mind, but for the purpose of the will of God on earth. Make sense? Yeah. So your body is not your own. It's the temple of God. So we can't play around with this thing. It's raised, your body, raised solely for the Lord. Now, three words that if the church would have just kept meditating on, they would have never gotten in bad theology, and we wouldn't be in this shape that the church is in. Jesus is Lord. Well, what's wrong with that? I, I believe you believe that, but you go to him as you as if you're Lord, telling him what to do. Wanting him this, that. Look, I, 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 I'm like, nobody here is exempt from a bad life. You may, I, I guarantee you people here have been bankrupt. I guarantee you people have gone through divorce here. I guarantee people have lost people, maybe kids in death and so forth. I guarantee we've had accidents in our, in our families, maybe even to us. I guarantee no one here is exempt from hell unleashing itself on us. No one is exempt from that. So you can't go to God and, and, and act as if life down here has to be fair. Again, that's a narcissistic mentality. Nowhere does he say life will be fair to you. In fact, when I look at the Gospels and I hear the message, it's die, die, martyrdom. Paul suffered more than anybody besides Jesus, and all minus one of the disciples were martyred. Not a Joel Osteen feel-good gospel. That's not the gospel. And America has had an easy, easy life down here because of the way our forefathers created a constitution. And it's a good one. It gave us a good life. But now the enemy's getting into certain politicians and trying to destroy that good life. And now the church is going, and America's going to have to wake up to some type of persecution. Because it's not always going to be easy street. That's just America. You cannot take the way these people preach in America and go over to a third world country and preach that message when their family just got killed for, for persecution, for being Christians. And they can't find food to, 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 for the next day. This, this over here stuff doesn't work anywhere else but here. And that, that's, that's a detriment to us. Because we are American gospel people. And you got to take the American out of it. I thank God for the ease that we've had. But that's not the gospel. And that's not the majority of the church. They're under persecution. And they're not going to, I guarantee you, when you've got a gun to your head, you're not going to go to God telling him what you want. Your, your whole prayer life is going to change. And maybe that's why America's going through this. Maybe it's a shaking, a sifting to get us back where we need to be and get out of all this bad theology and me, 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 self-help gospel stuff and get the message back, and get, the, get our prayers back, get our prayers oriented back again the way that they should be, which is what I'm trying to do here. And I'm losing time here on this. Let me, let me hear it. Where, where am I at? Where am I at? Um, so, your body's not your own. It's a temple of God, so we can't play around with it. How many are ready to surrender? Every thought, every action... Word, deed, and desire. Surrender. 
and present yourself a living sacrifice solely for what God is doing and nothing else. Nothing about your body is about you. That's what I get out of the scriptures. Nothing about your body is about you. You're not your own, he said. It's all about Jesus. To know his will, produce it in power on earth. My mind is to know his will and produce his power. Daily poise your mind to know his will so you can produce his power on earth. And 1 Corinthians 2.16 says we have the mind of Christ. Now, I have the mind of Christ, you have the mind of Christ, and I can think as you will and do the will of God. My mind is renewed to this truth, his truth, and I'm liberated from looking at my life and interpreting those things. Do you, just, do you get that? we got to get to the place where we quit trying to interpret life. Why did this happen? Why is this going on? All that does is create a daily pity party that brings you down. Because complaining to God about it is not changing his will. So, yes, it sucks down here. I don't like what's going on in my life. But I'm not going to be moved by it because I know what he's doing up there trumps what's going on down here. And if I don't line up with what he's doing, this gets me every time. I cannot overcome this unless I bring this on earth. This will always bring me down if I'm not going up there to hear what he's doing. Because it's tough. This stuff you see every day. Every waking hour, you wake up like, oh, God, not another day. we got to go through this again. You know, and I'm like that. I guarantee you tomorrow morning if I don't go to heaven and I don't, I don't get my time with God and get my mind renewed, I'm going to wake up tomorrow going, you've got to be kidding me. This is Monday. Here we go again. I got a podcast. I got people I got to meet Monday. I got a podcast to do Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I got to start on Bible study for Thursday. Thursday, I got to finish it up. Thursday, I got the Bible study. Friday, I got to start working on Sunday. Saturday, I got to put everything together for Sunday. And here I am Sunday. And when I wake up tomorrow, I'm like, we got to do that again. If you don't get heaven in on that, well, you just all this stuff you do for God. That's all religious activity if He ain't on it and in it. Don't think because I do this stuff, that makes me any special. Because if I don't have him on what I do, I'm going to burn out real quick. I've got people telling me, you're doing too much, you need to stop. Well, I probably will when it gets about when it's about me doing it. Because then I'll burn out. Because that's just And then the radio. Oh, we never talked about the radio, all that stuff. I mean, you don't know how many hours I preach and teach a day and prep. I've got to get, gotta prepare for all that stuff. I can't do that if I'm not seated in heavenly places accessing that power. The minute I stop that, you're going to see it in my messages. You're going to see it. You'll just see things just fall apart. And that's the way with, with all of us. So we, we can't go to God with what's going on down here. That's burning us out. How many, honestly, how many are burned out on the COVID-19 talk? How many are burned out on going back to school? What about sports? How many is burned out on the rhetoric? I can't do it anymore. Now, this will drive me insane. Because it's already had, I had to quit watching certain, I don't watch the bad ones. Because they'll just, I'll tell you, you're, you're, you feel like you're in an alien world. I, ha, I can't even watch the good ones, because you know what the good ones do? Tell me what the bad ones are saying. And I'm still hearing it. I don't watch Nancy Pelosi. But they'll show me her clip of what she said, and I'm like, I don't want to watch her. I don't want to hear her. I don't hate her. I just don't agree with what she's doing and the way she goes about it. And I don't want to hear that rhetoric. I don't want to hear any more lies. I don't hear any more deception from any of them. And I have to, I have to close my... It was getting to me. People are out there are on edge. Why? What I'm saying here, you're in, we are interpreting life the way they want us to interpret it, or the way we want to, we're never even going to find out what he's saying about life. All you need is one word from God, and none of this will move you. You'll have joy unspeakable, full of glory, through it all. You'll have peace that surpasses all understanding. You can't get joy and peace out of looking at the conflict and talking about it. You can't get peace and joy out of rehearsing the rhetoric you're hearing. All you can get peace and joy of is when you go up there and hear what he's doing. And by the way, I guarantee you, because it's biblical, 
You're not going to go up there and hear him be on the side of the Republicans. You're not going to hear him be on the side of the Democrats. He doesn't take sides. He's the side we are to take. So when you get so moved by sides and you become part of the polarization, you're useless. I'm going to say that again. When you take sides and become part of the polarization, you're no longer light and salt. You're useless down here to him. Because he's, if you get on his side, then you can manifest in spite of the sides. I'm not a side person. I'm not on one or the other. I am in the middle. God, not middle. I'm not moderate. I'm not even part of that whole thing. I'm kingdom minded. If there is a, if there was, if there's Republican, Independent, Democrat, I want one more called Kingdom. That's what I'm about. Kingdom, not this stuff. Because they're all liars, guys. You got to know that. They're the biggest deceivers. You get a good guy going in there, but he gets deceived and he gets polluted and influenced, and he's part of the problem now. Mr. Smith no longer goes to Washington. Right? So we don't want to pray what you see or naturally think. You cannot talk to God about what you naturally see or what you think. Once you're saved, you're not about you, you're about him. 2 Corinthians 4.18 proves this. 2 Corinthians 4.18. While we look not at the things which are what? Now, everything you can see, don't look at it. Now, this is going to change the whole dynamic of prayer. You can't go to God about what you see. Because he just told you, don't look at what's seen. All right, so if I can't, if I can't look at what is seen, what am I supposed to do? But look at the things which are not seen. Now you think you're talking to a lunatic. This guy's on LSD or something. What do you mean? How can I not look at the things that I see? Paul knows this. He's lived this. He knows that the things that are seen can't be changed by looking at them and taking the seen things to God. So if I go to God about what's going on down here, what am I looking at? The seen? The seen? So where's the unseen? Where's the unseen? Yeah. So I'm to look at the unseen, and to look at the unseen, I've got to, by prayer, go to heaven. I'm already seated there. And we talked about this. Again, this is mind-blowing stuff. I'm on earth and in heaven at the same time. Because Paul says, I'm seated in heavenly places. My citizenship is in heaven. So my spirit, because my spirit knows no time or space, because it's eternal, it's there. It's here. My body's down here. My spirit's up there. That's how I have a dual citizenship. And I can be, so I can go to heaven sit there and see things, hear things as the disciples did, as men and women have done in the past, hear God speak, see what he's doing. That's what he gives me permission to look at. He does not give you permission to look at what is in the seen realm. Make sense? We're not living for the seen. We're living for the eternal. Because he goes on to say, for the things which are seen are temporal. Meaning that it might be like that today, but it's temporal, which means it has an expiration date on it. It can change in 24 hours. So I'm not going to look at what's seen, because it's going to change real quick anyway. I look at the things which are eternal. That's what we look at. Where's the eternal things at? In heaven. All right? So when you come to the place where none of these seen matters, everything shifts off its base. So I'm not going to be moved by what I see. I can't. I'm not supposed to look at it. Well, I, just, I hope that's the scripture you meditate on this week. Look at Romans 8.5. We're going to hurry up here. Romans 8.5. For they that are after the flesh. Now we're talking about the seen realm, the natural realm, earth. They that are after the flesh do, they can't help it. They mind the things of the flesh. And they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. So where are the fleshly things at? Here. They're the seen here on earth. Where is the spiritual things at? Heaven. Those are the unseen things. Next. 
For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So where do you want to set your focus? On death or life and peace? Now I, folk, I honestly, by looking at the scene, everything that's done here in the scene that comes from the earth comes from a death mode, meaning there's no life of God on it. See, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a tree that was alive, but they ate from it, and what? All this stuff is real. There was no death on it. It's real. But when I partake of it, I die. Some area of my life, if I drink the Kool-Aid, I die. If I drink from the living waters of heaven, I live. I drink from here, I die. I drink from there, I live. And if my mind is set on things down here, I die. Spiritually, I die. That could eventually kill me physically. It's a slow death. But if I, if I drink and live off of things in heaven where I am praying, then I live. And there's where my peace and my joy are. Now, that's Paul talking about the flesh. Now, Galatians 5.24 is going to blow you away. Galatians 5.24. And they that are Christ's have crucified. What? So why in the world are we flesh when it's been crucified? Unrenewed mind. That's it. You're still living the old way because you still don't know who you are. Because when you look at Romans 8 and look at those verses, he tells you, let's go back to it. How do saints get to the mindset of the flesh when the flesh is dead? Because the devil lies to them and religion does as well. Look at Romans 8.10 now. We're in that same chapter. Or Romans 8, 9. Right? And if Christ be in you, I think there's a 9 there. Is there not a 9 there? Romans 8, 9. Ready? Anyhow, Romans 8, 9 says this. You are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. What he's describing in Romans chapter 8 is how the lost lives, who is not yet saved. Then he comes down to verse 9 and says, But you are in the Spirit, if you're saved. Right there. But ye are not in the flesh. So all that flesh talk, he's not talking about you. He's talking about them. He comes around to you and says, But you're not that way. Why do we act that way? Because you think you're in the flesh. As a man thinks, so he is. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So you're not in the flesh. You don't pray fleshly prayers. They do. And when the church does, it's because they don't know who they are. They're not living out of the truth. They're living out of the lie of religion that they still think that they're this, that, and the other because they don't know who they are. We've taught a lot about that. Go to the next one. Romans 8.10. 8, now, and if Christ be in you, and he is. Wow, this is a hard one to understand. The body is dead because of sin. But the spirit of life because of righteousness. I like that spirit of life, but I don't know what it means the body is dead. What that means is the body, go back. What that means is the body is mortal. And it's going to die. Sin dealt a death blow to the body and it's, what's it say? It's, it's appointed for every man to die and then the judgment. So we're all going to die. So the body is going to die, but the spirit is going to live on. Right? So the spirit is the one, because the body's, the body's mortal. It's going to die, but the spirit lives on. Go to the next one. But if the spirit of him that raised us up, raised Jesus up from the dead, dwells in you, and we know the Spirit raised Jesus up, and he says that same Spirit is in us, dwelling in us. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall, and shall also what? Now we just saw that the body is dead because of sin. But now that I'm born again, that body will go to the grave, but it's no longer subject to the sin around it. He says my body's been quickened by the Holy Spirit that dwells in me. So there's a quickening of my body, meaning that I'm not subject to the things going on down here. I overcome. See, right now, everybody that's lost, their body is definitely dead, that is going to, to the grave, but it's also dead because their spirit is not alive. It's not been quickened. 
So now you've got these people that are dead dying. Here we're people that are alive and dying, but they're the dead, walking dead, dying. They have two deaths. We'll have one because we became alive again and we'll die, but they have, they're, die, they're dead now and will die again. Does that make sense? So what Paul's saying here is those type of people are in the flesh. And they mind the things of the flesh. He's showing us this picture is not you. That's what I'm saying in Romans 8, or Paul. This picture he's painting up to verse 9 is not you. So why are we praying like this? Why are we acting like we're people of darkness or flesh? All right? So the body's dead, mortal meaning destined to die. Not our spirit. Paul emphasizes the spirit where all life, communion, and activity of heaven takes place. So the emphasis is on spirit. Spirit, spirit, not the body. Paul was fighting Gnosticism. It made it all about body. It made it all about what you could see. Um, so therefore, number one, life in me rules life outside me. Life in me, in my spirit, now that I've been quickened, my body's been quickened, my flesh is crucified, my spirit now rules and reigns through my body. My body can now hear spirit. My body can now touch spiritual. as Because my spirit does. Remember the body, soul, spirit thing that we did. All right? My body's not subject to the scene. So I'm not going to look at it. But their bodies are subject to the scene because that's what they're looking at. I'm governed by the unseen. The bodies of the unsaved are subject to the seen, all that is in the world. The saved is subject to all that is in heaven. Well, that's good. Now, quickly, the natural man does not receive from the kingdom of God. The recreated new spirit can man can only receive. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 5.50. Now, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we know flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Next. Let's get through this quick. Next. John. Yeah, John 3. Jesus answered and said, Except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So your spirit's got to come alive. Next. That which, as Jesus is saying this, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Okay? It's got no spirit on it. So you cannot take your cues from the earth because those are fleshly people doing fleshly things. And we're not people of the flesh. It's been crucified. We're people of the spirit. We hang out in heaven while they hang out on earth. But the church is hanging out on earth with them. Being fleshly minded because they don't know to tap into the spirit that's in heaven. See, see your spirit in heaven. And when you tap into your spirit, you're in heaven. Seeing and hearing what God is saying and doing. And Jesus says you've got to be born again. Otherwise, you're just flesh. And it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. All right? Now, how many things? Now, go, go to um, 1 Corinthians 5, 17. I've got to hurry up here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, what happens to him? He's no longer flesh. We know he's now spirit. He gives us a little bit more interpretation on what that new man is. He's a new what? Creature. And what happens? Old things, Old things are passed away. And behold, what becomes new? Now, come on. Look up the word all, and then you're a better theologian than most Christians. All means everything. That means every thought, every action, every deed, everything you used to think about, everything you wanted, every goal, every this, every that, all that's old. When you become born again, all that passes away. You become a new creation, a new man, a new woman, and everything becomes new. We don't like the new because it has nothing to do with us. Why? You died. Your body's not your own. You're a living sacrifice. It's got nothing to do with you. So how many are, how many have a five-year five goal plan? What you're going to uh, Here's where I want to be in five. Oh, yeah, really? What does James says? We ain't even allowed to say that we're going to do something in the next 24 hours. He says, you guys say, I'm going to go. You don't know it. It's, if God wills, you'll do it. Right? Is that what it says in James? He says, so you're going to have a five-year plan. That's what you're going to do? Now, that's okay if you've got it where? Now, now I know what I'm doing. I got it. This is why dreams and visions and words and prophecies, this is, all that's God's language to us. God speaks to us through still small voice. He speaks to us through dreams, visions, words, prophecies, promises. Now, when you get that stuff from the throne, you know how to navigate now. You know what to expect. 
You don't know everything, but at least it puts you on, it charts a new course that goes with the new because the old has passed away. So how you hear worldly wisdom and how they told you how you're supposed to live life, see, all that's not kingdom and it's got to go with your death. All things become new. So how many things are old and how many things are new? So nothing as it was. Nothing. You cannot continue business as usual. Your life as you knew it no longer exists. It's gone. And you've got to be looking for the new every day. What new thing is he doing and what old thing is passing away? Things like the way you think, how you live, your hopes, your dreams, your goals, all you thought you knew and all you thought when you perceived. The only thing that matters now is heaven. What's going on in heaven? Yeah. That's it. Nothing else matters. It's heaven alone. That's why, again, that prayer that Jesus gave us. The natural can never know or participate in that which is spiritual. The recreated spirit is the only one that can get there. Let's jump down to 1 Peter 1.3, and I'm done. You got, this is the best right here. We've got, we got, got to get this one in. The expectation of hope of the spiritual realm is the hope as God gives it, not hope as you naturally want things. 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, if you got your Bibles, underline lively hope. God is the only one that can give hope. Hope can only come from heaven. Now, we're raised to an inheritance, so the inheritance must have an element of living expectation in it. An inheritance predestined by him and it works everything after the counsel of his will, Ephesians 1 11. The inheritance you have been given and born again to has an expectation of God to be made manifest in you. So here's what's happening. The church teaches you to expect God to move on your behalf. God's like, no, I expect my inheritance in you to be manifested. God's on the side of expectancy. The faith teacher's got you expect. You got to expect, brother. Well, that puts you in the driver's seat. What are you expecting God to do? The expectation of hope is on God's side. My hope is in his expectation of him manifesting my inheritance. on So I'm expecting or believing, trusting him to manifest my inheritance. I didn't ask for it. Did you ask to get saved? Something in you did it. Now you may have made the profession, but what put the desire there? He says, we were called before the foundation of the world, so you weren't allowed to say, hey, I'll sign up for that. You were called before you were born. So what choice did you have in the matter? In fact, we may be a little long here, and I'm, I'm not real long all the time. In fact, let me tell you how much choice you have in life. Did you choose whether you wanted to be a man or woman? You got it. You got what came out. Did you choose what parents you wanted to be born to? Did you choose what time frame you wanted to be born into? Okay. So did you choose what geographical area to be raised in? In fact, when you think about along, along those lines of thought, what, what choice did you even have about anything? And what makes you think you have a choice now regarding your life and destiny? If I had no choice in all that, what makes me feel like I have a choice about what goes on down here? Why not? Because the choice has already been made called inheritance. You were raised to an inheritance by the resurrection of Jesus. And I think the next verse is the inheritance verse. Four. The next verse. To an inheritance. That's what we're raised to. Not, not, if, it's, if what you want's not in your inheritance, walk away from it. It's not what he's doing. I go to heaven to find out what's in my inheritance because that's what I'm raised to. And God expects that inheritance to be manifested through me on earth. I'm out of the equation, man. Don't forget, I died. It's, I don't have a say-so about anything. All I am is to present my body a living sacrifice to him in prayer. Because that's the focus here today is in prayer. All right? Now, the difference between these two, no expectation from you to find out or to conjecture onto God what it should be, but from God toward you. The difference is night and day. I must end my quest. It's not about me trying to find out. It's about God revealing. So I don't got to figure anything out. The difference is this. Here's an example. The, the, if the light's on, I see. 
Lights are on, you see. Rather me in the dark groping to find the switch because I can't see anything. Once you got born again, light came in. You see. And God makes sure you see because he gives you the Holy Spirit and your ability to pray in heaven. He gives you that ability to see. I can't walk in what I don't know, and neither can you. I live in the light as he is in the light because he is that light. Those lost walk in darkness. They can't even find the switch. Have you ever gone to a room and it's dark? And like if you go to a, um, there's this one, I don't remember where it's at. There's this one restaurant we used to go to. And it'd get me every time. I'd go, they'd leave the light off. I'd go in there and I'm just like, where is that switch at? And it's in the stupidest place. I had to ask the lady one the first time, where's the switch at? Why? Because when I see darkness, I'm looking for the switch. If I'm in light, I care. How many know where the light switch of this building is? Who knows where the light switch is? Right outside. Well, and, uh, the reason why you know is because you've used it. Yeah. But if you didn't have, if you never came in here when it was dark, you never went for the switch. And most of you do not know where this light switch to this sec to this sanctuary is because when you walk in, it's what? Light. And switch never comes to your mind. See, that's us. We live light. We don't live for switch We're because we're in the darkness. I don't ever think about switch because I'm always in the light. They, in the flesh, are in the dark. They're groping around. You're seeing the chaos that's going on in the world today as a result of them trying different switches because they are in the dark. Let's make all let's make 160 genders because we don't know how to do this. So we're looking for 160 switches. What we'll do, they're always looking, they're always changing everything. Masks work, masks don't work. This, that, because they're in the freaking dark. There's no light. All they're concerned about is the switch because they're in darkness. You and I live light. We live life because we're in the light, as he is in the light. I know what's going on. If I'm praying and accessing that realm, or, or, or is the church in the darkness with the rest of them looking for switches? I, I'm sad to say that most of the church is in the darkness looking for switches. Because they, they're, they're not there accessing, living from the realm of heaven, and knowing by being in the light. You don't understand, and I hope that you do, is that that spirit, that's how I went with all these scriptures. The spirit, when you got born again, lights came on. There's no more groping. There's no more wandering or wandering around. You know. Paul says you know all things. All things are yours. You know all things. So I'm not looking for a switch. I'm seated in heavenly places, and I'm in the light, and I see. And I walk down here according to what I see up there. That's why prayer is so important. You cannot... And again, well, I pray, but look at your prayers. Is it just a list of things to pray for? That's how they teach you to pray. Get a prayer list. Pray for mom today. Pray for dad. Pray for the president. Pray for the government. Pray for my pastor. Pray for this. Pray. That is not what we're talking about. He says, you go to heaven. You pray what you hear. You do what you see. You cannot let a piece of paper dictate how to pray. And that's why I don't do prayer meetings, because most people don't know how to pray, and we're wasting our time. I've been in so many of them, and I hear, we can't help but hear people pray. They want everybody to hear them pray. I hear the prayers. They're not biblical. And you got another prayer thing coming up. And you got another prayer thing coming up. They're calling it. Are, what are they going to do? Are they just going to go and tell God what they think he ought to do? Remember what I said? If I don't see him do it, then I don't do it down here. I don't hear him say pray it. I ain't praying it down here. How hard is that? I'm going to offend you, but I, I offend myself too. And I offend Jesus by what I'm about to say. This isn't hard. Monkey see, monkey do. How hard is that? I got, all I got to do is go to heaven and wait in his presence, hear what he's saying. I heard that. And I'm going to say it down here and orient my life in the direction of what I'm hearing. How hard is that? I don't got to make it up. I don't got to be real smart, figure it out. I just got to hear him say it. And when I hear him say it, it's done in the spirit realm. It's done. 
Now it's going to manifest sometime here on earth. When I see him do something, okay. Give those people that money, okay. How hard is monkey see, monkey do? I'm sorry. It, it, I'm glad it's that simple. The church has made it so hard to relate to God. We're always trying to find him out. You know, can't figure out this, can't figure out that. What's going on here? What's going on? I just wait and hear what he's doing. All right, I hear that, and I do it. If I don't hear, I don't do it. If I don't see, I don't, I don't act. I don't speak, I don't act. Jesus said, I only do what I hear my Heavenly Father. So I only say what I hear my Heavenly Father say. I only do what I hear my Heavenly Father do. We're going to get into hope. I ain't got time to get into hope. We're, we're way past time here. We'll, we'll, we'll part two this next week. Because the hope is important, and I don't want to rush through it. So um, I just I, what I what I'm sensing. Why am I doing all this? What why is the Spirit laying this on my heart? Is because we've got to be a people of prayer. Right praying, not religious praying, not praying so we can say we did it. Because nothing gets done if you're not praying right. Who's Lord? Just remember when you're going to pray, who's Lord? You telling Him what to do, or are you waiting to hear Him tell you what to do? Do you, do you see how this is an epidemic in the church, how it's flipped to the other side? I'm, I, I, I stopped the, the prayer meetings with people because I, I, I didn't completely understand years ago why I, maybe I'm just a backslider who doesn't like to pray. I don't know. Something's wrong with me. And as you grow and you realize there's no life on it because it's backwards. They're telling God rather than hearing God. And they're speaking what they want, not what they heard in heaven. And I'm not into that. that I've, I've been into that for my, even my personal life. It's so hard not to go to God the old way. And you've got to remind yourself, no, He's Lord. It's not about what I want. My body's a living sacrifice. I can't want what I want when I want it. I'm one with you. So what are you doing? Lord, I'm accountable to you. What are you doing? And then I will speak what I hear, and I will do what I see. And when I don't, hey, thank God, take a break. God's not requiring anything of you right now. Just rest. Go do your daily grind. Huh? Why do we got to act like it's got to be all or nothing? If he's not speaking, you're not required to speak anything. You wait. You continue to wait. You might wait for five weeks. And not hear anything. Man, rest. Because he's got something coming that's going to challenge you. So you better get your rest while you're not hearing and seeing. Because it's coming. And then the little things too. Like if you, like I said last week, I said you wake up and say, Lord, what are you doing? Well, I don't know. I didn't hear anything. But 1 o'clock, he spoke to me what to do. 2 o'clock, I know what to do. This situation came up. I know exactly what to do. We're out. I'd already asked him and the Spirit gave it to me that quick right there on the spot which is the gift of wisdom. So, I don't know. you got to walk this out yourself. Holy Spirit has to show it to you. Um, and I hope that we can be people of prayer. And maybe one day we can get together periodically or whatever and pray together. But I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not challenged to do that yet unless we understand what we're doing in the arena of prayer. Heavenly Father, continue to open our eyes. I don't claim to know everything about prayer. I'm still learning. I'm still being challenged by the truth, by the word. And I just hope, God, that you will continue to just lead and guide us to be the people you've called us to be in the arena of prayer. But God, we are not going to look at the scene. This, the scene is killing us. The scene is depressing us. The scene is, has us all set on edge. We do nothing for ourselves or for the earth by looking at the scene. All we do is state the obvious at that point. But Lord, we got to see the unseen realm. We live by, we live for the unseen realm. We've got to stop the illegal prayers. They're not what you they're not prayers originating in heaven. They're prayers that originate from earth because of what we're looking at. If you're looking at the scene, then your prayers will originate from the scene. If you're looking at the unseen, then what you pray originates from the realm of heaven. So 
Father, just open our eyes to this. Renew our minds to it. We're the only ones who know what's going on in heaven with God on earth. No one else knows this. And we won't know it either if we don't engage Him in the arena of prayer to hear and see what He's doing. Let's stand. I want to lead you in a prayer of, um, of surrender of the old ways that should have passed away when you got born again, but you were never taught, so they stayed with you for a while. So, Father, we surrender old. We surrender old. And we receive new. All things become new. And those all things do not come from the seen realm. They come from the unseen realm. Old is the seen realm. Keep looking at it. Keep regurgitating it. You never go nowhere. Unseen realm is the new. That's what you're bringing in. You took, you're taking the old out. You're bringing in the new. And the new is in the unseen realm. New can only be found out by praying in heaven, hearing heaven, seeing heaven, the unseen realm, and then manifesting it on earth. So Lord, we just surrender the old and we receive the new. We may not even know all that that entails, but by faith we know new is you. Old is not. Old was, was us. Old was us, new is you. So I don't know what all new is. It may not be right, it may not be perfect for me and what I want, but it's right and perfect to you because it's your will. That reasonable service of a living sacrifice according to your perfect will. New is your perfect will. And I receive it. I surrender.